Graham is meeting local historian Jim Rees to find out the name of his great-great-grandfather. They've come to the yard of the Walker's old house in Carnews Wool Green, next to the church where George Walker was sexton. Jim has copies of land valuation books dating back to the 19th century, which record property transfers from one generation to the next. There's a George Walker. That's my grandfather. Okay. Yes, and... Uh, yeah, that would be 1950. He, 1950. Yeah. Well, we'll just come back. Uh, well, there's a William Walker. William Walker. So that would be my great-grandfather. Yes. And we have... Here's the transfer. William replaced Joseph Walker as a tenant. Wow. That must be... That must be William's father, Joseph Walker in Woolgreen. Through the land valuation books, Graham has discovered that William's father was Joseph Walker, his great-great-grandfather. And the books give another detail about Joseph's life. This property was transferred to his son William from Joseph's name as a tenant on the Fitzwilliam estate. And you can see it as uh, from Fitzwilliam. Fitzwilliam was the owner all the way through. Yeah, yeah. So the Walkers here in Mulgreen, they'd yes. have just been tenant farmers on the Earl of Fitzwilliam's land. That's it, exactly. The Fitzwilliam estate was one of the largest in Ireland, covering a fifth of County Wicklow. The estate was founded in the 1630s by Thomas Wentworth. He was at the forefront of the plantation of Ireland when English and Scottish Protestants settled on lands seized from Irish Catholics. Thomas Wentworth's descendants married into the Fitzwilliam dynasty and continued to plant English Protestants on their Irish lands. By Joseph Walker's time, a handful of English landlords like the 5th Earl Fitzwilliam, still owned 80% of Ireland. In 1845, when Joseph was in his 30s, Ireland was struck by its greatest disaster, the potato famine. Over a million people died, and a further two million emigrated. Both Protestant and Catholic suffered terribly. But Protestants were often favoured by their English landlords, who encouraged the emigration of poorer Catholics. After the famine, the tenants who remained had the chance to upgrade their holdings. And the land valuation books show that Joseph did just that. 1862, 63, he was at number four, Wool Green. 1865, he was at this place here, number two and number one. Obviously, his income was improving over those years because, because he'd gone to a bigger house or a more valuable house each time. Graham's heading back to Carnew Church to find out if Joseph Walker like George and William, was involved with the Church of Ireland. Hello, Canon Don. Hello, Graham. Hello, nice to see you. Dermot. Oh, Dermot. Well, now, um, I, as you probably know, I'm researching the Walkers, and I know that my grandfather George and his father William were very involved in the church, and uh, his father was a guy called Joseph Walker, and I just wondered, do you have any records of his involvement in the church in your papers? Well, the best records for people involved in the church are the vestry minutes. So this would be the source. I have one um, such vestry book here, which will detail what people did uh, in the community. Well, here we are, look here. All right. It was also resolved that Mr. Joseph Walker of Carnew be appointed something of deserted children. Probably overseer. 
He was obviously held in very high regard, and more than likely he was one of the church wardens. What's interesting about this is that in church records, you get an entry that is really uh, something to do with state, because the care of children of orphans would be a state responsibility. In Joseph Walker's day, Ireland was ruled from London, and the Protestant Church of Ireland was essentially an arm of government. Church wardens like Joseph acted as local councillors, overseeing the care of orphans and the building of schools and roads. Controversially, they could also levy local taxes from both Protestant and Catholic to pay for the Protestant church and the continuation of English rule. The select vestry at the time would have been given the power to set the rate for each householder to pay, and they'd pay into the coffers of the church. Irrespective of denomination, whether you were Roman Catholic or Church of Ireland, uh, uh, it, didn't, it didn't make a difference. You, you had to pay into this fund. Um, now, most of it went into the clergyman's pocket. He was a rich man at the time. All right. But... Those were the days. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but a minority was in government, ruling over the majority. So there must have been a bit of tension around it as well. In my head, you know, the church is very different from the state, but of course, at this stage, it wasn't. So, it, although they were respected, you could imagine that amongst you know, a large proportion of the community, the, the Roman Catholic community, these were not popular figures. The Walker family were part of the establishment of previous generations, like Joseph, those tensions between the Catholic community and the Protestant community, I think they must have been quite, you know, there had to be a huge amount of resentment. I'm sensing there was some anger in Carnew. Baptisms, 1813. To trace his family's Protestant roots even further back, Graham searches the parish baptism register for a record of Joseph's parents. Ten. Um, Joseph. Fifth uh, of May. Son of Thomas and... White Walker. Find out more about these people, because that's mine now. We're now up to my great, 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 great grandfather, yes. which is, that's very good going. He's back in the late 1700s, Hundreds isn't he? he is, and we don't have records going back that far. Um, there's a book missing. Is there anywhere to find those records? Um, the, the only place that you will find something would be in the estate papers of the Lord Fitzwilliam estate, because this was his estate town. So Graham has discovered that three generations of his family were Protestant tenants on the Fitzwilliam estate. And by identifying Thomas Walker, he has traced the family back to the late 18th century. I'm amazed, I'm thrilled that we've got back so far. And also, now that I know that Joseph's father was Thomas, uh, I can see that Thomas lived through 1798. And that's a big date in Irish history because there was a rebellion then. Basically a bunch of Catholics and people tried to get rid of the English. So I wonder what impact it had on Carnew and whether Thomas was involved or, you know, he just, he, mu he must have been because, you know, he was there. <laughs> The 1798 Rebellion was one of the bloodiest episodes in Irish history. Inspired by the French Revolution, it was started by the Society of United Irishmen, which included both Catholics and Protestant liberals. Their aim was to end English rule and establish a modern democracy. The fighting began in May 1798 when the United Irishmen clashed with English troops up and down the country. 
With 80% of Irish land owned by English landlords, the dispossessed Catholic majority tended to side with the rebels, whilst most Protestant settlers, like the Walkers, remained loyal to the Crown. Carnew, with its large Protestant population, was a notorious loyalist stronghold. But how did the rebellion affect Thomas and the Walker family? To find out, Graham's come to Enniscorthy, 30 miles south of Carnew. He's meeting historian Ruan O'Donnell at a centre that commemorates the events of 1798. These are extracts from the Fitzwilliam rental rolls. You can see here Thomas Walker. He's 66 in 1839, which means we can track his date of birth to 1773. And he was also clerk to the church in the town of Carnew. He would have been in the prime of life, a 25-year-old man during the Great Rebellion of 1798. And Carnew was a flashpoint of that rebellion. Uh, I mean, being involved in the church, presumably, would have immediately made you pro-government? Not necessarily, but in the town of Carnew, where the local minister was the Reverend Charles Cope, it would have. Because Cope was what was known as a clerical magistrate, popping on in some places a flogging magistrate, a man who was not only a, a minister, but a justice of the peace. He was someone who wanted a hands-on role in law of order, and he was a man who was involved in counterinsurgency operations against the United Irishmen in the late 1790s. As clerk to the church, Thomas Walker would have helped Reverend Cope hunt down suspected rebels. No records survive of Thomas's military role, but Ruin has found documents relating to other walkers from Carnew. From this document, you can see that Joseph Walker and William Walker were both listed as being yeomen from Carnew. Walker is a comparatively uh, rare name in this part of Ireland, and they are obviously members of the extended family. Yeomen were volunteer militia who fought for the English throughout the rebellion. As loyalists, the Carnew Yeomen were vulnerable to revenge attacks, as the Walkers found to their cost. And if you just look here, you can see at the top of the page, John Walker shot and piped at Shrule, which is near Carnew, of that parish. Wow. Um, it's unusual that he was shot and piped. Yeah, and we really didn't like him. <laughs> it signifies that he was put to death. It signifies that he was not sort of killed accidentally in a skirmish, that he was singled out and, and done to death. And what's weird is my Auntie May remembers that there were pikes from the rebellion. They kept them in their house. Is that right? Oh. Yeah. Mementos, war, war trophies. Uh, presumably. I don't. Um, but then again, you never know. Maybe everyone in Carnew had a pike from the rebellion in their house. 